normal, it's natural. How is it the bounty of Allah? And I, at that time, <coughs> Moana said, ask the person who cannot relieve himself naturally and needs a catheter and he will tell you what a bounty it is. There is a person in South Africa who was very, very ill and he passed away. May Allah fill his cover with noon. When he was ill in the hospital, I walked into his room one day to visit him. And he came out of the toilet. And I'll never forget, he held my hand and he said, you know, every time I came out of the toilet, I used to read the dua. He says, every time I came out of the toilet and I said this, I thought to myself, how can you say Alhamdulillah when you came out of the toilet? What's the wisdom behind it? He held my hand and he said, Mulana, today is the first time in a week that I could go myself and relieve myself in the toilet. When I walked out today, I understood what it means to say Alhamdulillah. Allah has blessed you and I with so much. In Makkah al Mukarramah, at the time of iftar in Ramadan, people are all in Umrah, it is hot, and people are making tawaf of Baytullah. People are in their Umrah. One particular Ramadan, we were standing on the Mataf, and people are making tawaf. So when the Adhan of Maghrib goes, there are those who are sitting and eating, and then there are those who carry on with their tawaf, and they need to finish their Umrah. We were standing in front of the Kaaba. And a person comes past and the adhan goes. It is over 40 degrees. He is in ihram. He is in his umrah. And he is tired and you can see the fatigue in his face. And as he comes past and the adhan of Maghrib goes, so I extend some dates to him. And he looks at me and he doesn't take the date. So I think to myself, it's hot. The man is tired. Maybe he wants water. So I go and I get a glass of zamzam and I present it to him. So he looks at the Zamzam and he still doesn't take it. So I thought to myself, Ya Allah, what have I done wrong that in front of the Kaaba this man is not taking from my hand? This man then did this with his shoulders and when he did this with his Ihram, the top piece of his Ihram fell down and it was then that I saw this man does not have hands. He turned around right at the Kaaba and he said, Hal shakar tarabba hadh al -bayt? Have you ever thanked Allah, the Lord of this house, for the hands that you have? That you can pick up food with your hand and put it into your mouth? Have you thanked Allah that you can pick up a glass and eat and drink it on your own? Have you ever thanked Allah for these hands that we have? Mm -hmm. We tend to count what we don't have. Whenever we're talking, we say, I don't have this and I don't have this and I still need to do this and I still need to get that. Is it not high time that we start counting what we actually have? For every human being, there is something that you are making dua for. There is something that you have that somebody else is making dua for. There is something that Allah has given you that you are oblivious of the fact that it is a bounty of Allah that somebody else is making dua for. In Houghton, in a place in South Africa, in the masjid one day there was a brother who had a little tube next to him. And every few minutes he would lift this tube and put this liquid into his eye. And I said to him, do you have an eye infection? He said, no. So I said to him, every few minutes you're putting these drops into your eye. He looked at me and he said, the gland that keeps my eyes moist has dried up. Every few minutes I have to put this drop because if I don't, my eyes will dry and I won't be able to open or close it anymore. Allah. Subhanaka Ya Rab. Has any of us ever thought of that as a bounty of Allah? وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا This is what it means. Allah has given us so much that we will never ever be able to satisfy and do justice to gratitude to Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world, with creating the world, Allah has given us challenges. There's always been crisis in life. There's always been crisis in humanity. From the time of Adam alayhi salam, there was crisis. The sons of Adam alayhi salam had a crisis. Yusuf alayhi salam had a crisis in the well. Ibrahim alayhi salam had a crisis being thrown into the well. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam had a crisis in Ta'if. He had a crisis when there was a hit on his life. There was a crisis on so many occasions in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Sahaba radiallahu anhum went through crisis. The ummah has always been through difficulties and crisis. It is nothing new. But understand, whenever Allah created a crisis, Allah created hope. It is that same Allah that created that situation that always created hope. 
That is why what Nabi Sallallahu say, a mu'min is one who never loses hope in Allah. La tayasumi rawhillah. Despite the crisis, despite the situation, never ever lose hope in Allah. Because every one of us that is sitting here today, there was a time in your life when you were making dua sincerely to Allah for something and Allah gave it to you. Every one of us sitting here, there was a time in your life when you were sincerely asking of Allah either to remove something or to give you something and Allah gave it to you. Allah never ever gave us a test without giving us hope. Allah has always given us hope. Today in the world, that is exactly what we have. There is a crisis. Go throughout the world. The Syrian crisis. Everywhere you turn, the Ummah is in crisis. But has Allah only created the crisis? Has Allah only created the challenges? Let me tell you. Go into the desert in Jordan. Go into the desert of Jordan. Drive over what is not even a road. And you come in the middle of what is the, now the desert and a few people have now gathered. Who are these people? These are people who lived in Syria, who had normal homes, who had wealth, who had everything. And overnight, they left what they had, they grabbed what they could, and they walked across. Not drove across, walked across. I've met people who say we put on two sets of clothing because we couldn't carry anything. We had children, we had old people. So we put on two sets of clothing, at least we've got two sets. They walked across into the Jordanian desert and now they are sitting in the, royal, in the desert of Jordan in the heat. And as we drive there, I see a huge water tank saying Al-Imdad. Has Allah not created hope? You drive in and you see a tent. Recently we were there to take people out of a tent and put them into a little container. For you and I, the container is probably not even the size of our smallest room in our home. But wallah, I met families who are 12 people who are going to live into this little container. And if you saw the joy on the faces of these people, you would imagine that somebody gave them a palace. What has Allah given you and I? And what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested people with? These people are living out in the desert. Allah has created hope for them also. Allah has given them hope. And that hope which I have seen with my eyes is called Al-Imdad. And Al-Imdad is not one person. Yes, Allah blessed three or four people. And sometimes I sit with Allah and I think to myself, you know, in every era, Allah created somebody who He has blessed and who have spread deen. And who have strengthened deen. And who have blessed humanity. And I sometimes think that from a little town in South Africa, Allah created this organization that today is throughout the world. It's mind-boggling with regard to the work that takes place. But what is the message? The hope that Allah has created is you and I. Allah has given you and I the ability to become the hope of humanity. Ali radiallahu anh said, the greatest bounty, the greatest ni'mah, that Allah can give anybody is for somebody to see me as an avenue for the fulfillment of their desires. For someone to see me as an avenue of the fulfillment of their request. Ali radiallahu an said that is the biggest bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can ever give you. For somebody to look at you and say, you know, I can go to this person because I need something. Imagine who is saying this. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. He says this is the greatest bounty that Allah can give anybody. For somebody to be able to know that I have some dilemma in my life, I have some problem, this person can resolve my problem. This person will listen to me. That is the greatest bounty in the eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do we even look at it as a bounty of Allah? You know, in every family you have one person who is always there, who everybody go to. And whenever there's a, a crisis in the family, everybody go to this person. Whether it's an emotional crisis, a, a relationship crisis, a financial crisis, whatever it is, people always go to that one person. Sometimes what do we say? Why always me? Sometimes we say, don't others also have a home to feed? Why always my home? Don't others also have to give? Why always me? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Rasulullah said, Inna lillahi khalqan. If from today's entire talk you only take away this, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna lillahi khalqan khalaqahum li hawaij al-nas yafza'u al-nasu ilayhim li qada'i hawaijihim. 
Allah has created a selected amount of people in the world. And Allah has created them for the fulfillment of the rights of people and of the responsibility of people. Allah has chosen them to go and sort out all the problems of people. People will go to them for their problems. People will go to them as a solution. What will these people get? What did Nabi Sallallahu say? أُولَٰئِكَ الْآمِنُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ on the day of Qiyamah, even the Anbiya will be running from pillar to post saying, what are we going to do? The sun is above our heads. The sun people are drowning in their own perspiration. What did Nabi Sallallahu say? أُولَٰئِكَ الْآمِنُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Those will be the people who will be safe on the day of Qiyamah. When Allah has chosen you and Allah has given you that opportunity, never, ever, ever, ever look at it as a burden. <laughs> when you can be there to, to make put a smile on somebody's face, Take it as a bounty of Allah. Hmm. Ibn Abbas an, walks into the masjid one day. He sees a man sitting in the corner fi ghayri waqt salah. It's not the time of salah. But this man is sitting in the masjid sad. So Ali ibn Abbas an, walks up to him and says, Mali araka hazina. What is wrong, brother? Why do I see that you are so sad? And this person started speaking to Ibn Abbas. An. And at the end of the discussion, he said, Oh, Ibn Abbas, I have got a problem with a particular person, but I don't know how to approach him. Ibn Abbas عنه, held this person's hand and he was walking out of the masjid. He said, Brother, come, I will talk to this person. Let me solve this problem. Oh, yeah. As he's leaving the masjid, someone comes to him and says, Oh, Ibn Abbas, ila ain? where are you going, oh, Ibn Abbas? Ibn Abbas عنه, said to him, I am going to do a deed, the reward of which is more beneficial than 70 years of ibadat in Masjid al oh. This person said to him, Wa ayyu hadha? Wa ayyu amalin hadha? What action can be more virtuous than 70 years of nafil ibadat, or 70 years of i'tikaf in Masjid al -Nabawi? He says, qada wa hawa'ij nas to fulfill one right that a person has got. To solve one problem of one person, is more better than making i'tikaf for 70 years. Allah. Allah has given us, all of us. Yesterday I heard a young girl here in the UK was having some issues in her life. She had challenges. She has passed away. May Allah fill her qabr with nur. May Allah make it easy for her parents. She found who? She found one of the leading figures of Alim Dad, who is a lady in South Africa. She would chat to her for hours on end and she refuses to speak to anybody else. What does it take for a person here in the UK to speak to someone all the way in South Africa? When there is absolutely no monetary difference between them, there's no physical relationship between them. What does it take for a person here to only find solace in a girl all the way in South Africa? This is when somebody puts themselves forth to serve Allah in Allah's creation. Allah puts that love in the heart of the person. This is what you and I should see as a bounty. Sometimes all a person wants is just someone to listen. Sometimes all that a person needed was for someone to walk up to you and say, How are you? You're looking good. When he would come to the toll gate on the road where you need to pay, he would stop there. And he would ask the person, how are you today? How's your day going? And he would say something to make them smile. Somebody said to him, Mana, what benefit is this? Mana said, the whole day this person sits here collecting money which is not theirs, which goes into the government coffers. Do you think this is a nice job? He says, if somebody can even once a day at least ask the person, how are you? If somebody can even put a smile on their face, what difference would it make? Understand that Allah has selected you and I as Muslims for that. This is nothing that is unique to, 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 to humanitarian work today. This is something that you and I as Muslims have been gifted by Allah. To walk out of here in the country you love and help an old person crossing the road is what a Muslim does. When you are driving in your car that Allah has blessed you and you see an elderly lady walking with a packet in her hand and you stop and you tell her, let me give you a lift and you let her sit in your car and you take her to her home and you give her a packet and you say, may your day go well. 
whether she's a Muslim or non-Muslim, then you are a Muslim. Then you have done what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Inna lillahi khalqan khalaqahum li hawaijin nas. When you will go out and you see a non-Muslim and you smile at that person. When you go out and a non-Muslim was about to take the parking bay that you, were in the, you have indicated to park in and it was your right and you see this person go in and you smile at them and you lift your hand and you say no problem. Then you are a true Muslim. Then you have fulfilled what Allah has given you. Then you have fulfilled the responsibility that Allah has put on your shoulders. We, Mana Yunus Pati Rahmatullah had a heart problem and he went into the hospital. He stayed there for seven days. The day he was discharged, he said to his son, there are 12 nurses who looked after me, please bring 12 gifts. The day he was leaving, he called all of them. So they all came into the room. And he took these gifts and he gave it to them. And they said, sir, it is our duty and we get paid to look after you. He said, it's your duty to look after me medically was not your duty to be courteous to me. It was not your duty to smile with me. It was not your duty to ask me how am I feeling. That was out of the goodness of your heart. And then he said to them that our Prophet has taught us always be good to those who have done good to you. And he gave them a gift. Out of 12 of them, the day he was discharged from hospital, four of them came front and said, this is your religion. And we testify that there is none worthy of worship but Allah. Allah. How many people have we ever touched? When Allah has given every one of us in this masjid today the potential to be hope for humanity. Allah has given all of us the ability, despite the crisis, to become the hope of humanity. Man kana fi hajati akhi, kana Allahu fi hajati. The one who serves humanity, Allah will serve their own. You know, sometimes we sit back and we think, how is it that this person gets everything they want? How is it that this person is always progressing? Have we never thought, Man kana fi hajati akhi, the one who goes out to serve the, the creation of Allah, Allah will serve their, response, their work, Allah will fulfill their work. In, in, in the Syrian people who came into Jordan, we go to one particular home and we ask, this youngster comes out and I ask him, is there any elder person in this home? So he goes and he tells his mother. She throws a sheet over her and she comes to the door. She comes to the door and her first question is, who are you? So I said, we are from South Africa and we are here with the organization to give you some assistance. She says, is that your only motive? Why, you, why have you come here? So I said, we've come with no other motive. We've come here just to give you this assistance. Yeah. She says, when the whole world has shunned and forgot the Syrian people, why are you here? So we say to her sister, this is just something for you. What, does, what is her answer? She says, my neighbor next door does not have sons. <coughs> I've got a son. If I am in a desperate situation at the moment, I can send my son out. Whatever you've brought for me, please give it to my neighbor. She needs it more. You read this in the Quran. Sahaba gave preference over themselves to who? To their fellow Muslims. Why? Despite them being more in needy than their own brother, they always gave preference. Each one of us in this masjid probably know the incident yeah. of the three Sahaba who are lying in a battlefield and his nephew brings some water to him and his nephew gives it to the uncle and the uncle looks at the man next to him who's lying down in the pains of death and he says, my, my nephew, give it to this man, he looks more needy. And he goes to him, by the time he gets to him, this man hears a moan on the other side yeah. and he says, oh my boy, don't give it to me, I think he needs it more. Yeah. By the time he reaches the third person, he already passed away. When he comes back to the second person, he already passed away. When he comes back to his own uncle, his uncle also passed away. Yeah. One glass of water, neither of the three drank. Why? They gave preference to others over themselves. This lady has fulfilled this ayat of the Quran, which you and I probably have never even thought of. She says, don't give me, give my neighbor first. These people understand something. Kullu ni'matin yub'iduka an rabbuk fa huwa musibah. Wa kullu musibatin yuqarribuka ila rabbik fa hiya ni'mah. Every bounty that has been given to you that distances you from Allah is not a bounty, it's a calamity. And every calamity that brings you closer to Allah it's not a calamity, it is a bounty. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about the Syrian people. Let me tell you about people who have absolutely nothing. Let me tell you about people 
who live in a tent over 40 degrees and have nothing in their tent. We go into one tent and we drive and we drive and we come into the middle of the desert. And when we get to this place, which is the middle of the desert and one little community of Syrians that are there, who were all super wealthy back in Syria, and now today come and stand in a queue for food. And we come to this place and I'm amazed. What am I amazed about? I'm amazed that by the time we got there and I was tired, the al Indad team went earlier and already had all the food parcels and all the hygiene packs literally in straight lines all packed out in the desert all we did we got off the car said a few words to them gave them the aid jumped into the car went to the next point when we got to the next point everything was ready got to the next point everything was ready the whole day from the morning to the evening was in the exact same way we come to one particular camp and i walk into one tent and every single tent has got a paper on the top will be the name of the head of the family 90 percent of the time the mother and below that, you'll have the photos and the names of all the children or her dependents. So I walk into one tent and I look at this, this particular paper. And I say to this old lady that on your paper, it says there's five children. I see only four. Where's the other one? So she looks at me and she says, I kicked him out of the tent. So I asked her here in the middle of the desert, when there's nothing else to go to, and the dangers of the desert, there are snakes, there are scorpions. I'm literally talking of a desert. So I said to her, why did you chase him out? Why did you kick him out of the tent? So she says, he must fajr this morning, so I kicked him out. So I asked her, you must have been a very Islamic orientated family back in Syria. She says, no, my son, we didn't even read Jum'ah Salah. She says, when we forgot Allah, then Allah took away everything we have. I told my children, now if we turn our backs on Allah, and Allah takes away even the stem that al gave us and this little food, then what will we do? I ask you a simple question, who's closer to Allah? That woman with that conviction, you and I. These people are, we met one old lady. When these people all gathered, and mashallah, you know the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anzilun nasa manazilahum, three people according to their level that Allah has given them. Two, a beggar comes to the door of Aisha radiallahu anha, and Aisha anha sends some food with her servant and she says, go and give it to the beggar. So the servant takes the food, gives it to the beggar at the door and the man leaves. After a little while, somebody else comes. Aisha anha tells the servant, lay the dasarhan, lay down the sufra, put the food on the ear, let him come in, enjoy his meal and then go. When the man is gone, the servant says, oh, our mother Aisha anha, why the differentiation here? Why was the first person given at the door and the second allowed to sit? She says, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Three people according to their level and their status. This man that came is a very honorable man. He is not used to taking things from the door. He is in a situation because of which he's knocking today. That's why I give it to him with dignity. I saw with my eyes where Alim Dad had invited a whole group of women and children and they set up a tent. If you came in there, you would think it's a wedding. And when I came in there, I looked at these people beautifully dressed and you know all of them sitting with dignity and we gave the food and they ate and before they started eating i said something to them i said to them we've come all the way from south africa today just to take your du'as and they looked very surprised and i said to them you are more beloved to allah than us so your du'as are more accepted so we've just come to take your du'as one lady stood up and she says wallah these words are more valuable to us than the food you've put on our table Sometimes all they needed was for the dignity to be reinstated. These are people who are super wealthy. This old lady comes forward with a stick. She walks up to me and she says, Sheikh, I was the one who was known to fight with all of my servants back in Syria if the aircon temperature was one degree away from the one that I wanted it on. She says, today I came in a bus with no aircon sitting at the window and I came here and I ate the food that Alim Dad gave us and I ate the food and I took the food parcel that Alim Dad has given. Who is, who sent this to them? What you have done and given your assistance went all the way down into the Jordanian desert for a Syrian person. Do you not think that the du'as you get from that is what is giving you and I safety and security? There is one particular home 
Subhanallah. We go into this home and we offer this lady some assistance. And she takes it and what is her words is we are leaving. She looks at me and she says, May Allah always keep you as in your progeny as a givers and never as a takers. Doesn't, doesn't strike. So as I'm walking away, the person who took us holds my hand and he says, Chef, do you know what she said? So I said, she said, May Allah keep you in your progeny as a giver. He says to me, in the time back in Syria, this was the home where people used to come to for assistance. They were givers. When she's saying today, she understands what it is to be a giver and the next day Allah makes you a taker. Mm -hmm. She says, that's why she says, may Allah give you, always make you a giver and never ever give you the test of being a taker. Today in the world, there is a lot of crisis, but there is a means of hope. You and I are that hope. Allah has given each and every one of us the ability and understand when we help others, we are not helping them. You think I'm mad? When we go out and assist people, who are we actually assisting? Ourselves. The difference, why Sahaba gave everything? Why, what motivated Sahaba? I asked today in this masjid, all of us that are sitting here. If someone were to ask, are you able to give half of your net worth in charity today? Don't answer it. Ask yourself. How many of us in this masjid would be able to say, I'm going to give half of my net worth in charity? Forget half. If I ask today, how many of us would be able to analyze and work out the figures and say, I'm going to give 10% of my net worth in charity? How did Sahaba do it? How did Sahaba come and give, O Rabbi of Allah, this is 50% of whatever I own? Nay, go beyond that. How did Abu Bakr radiallahu an able? What motivated this man to come in and say, O oh, Nabi of Allah, this is what I have? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him the question, Kam tarakt? Oh Abu Bakr, this is what you brought. What have you left at home? And he says, Taraktullah wa Rasulah. Oh Nabi of Allah, I've left Allah and his Nabi at home. I've brought I, everything that I own is here. To what extent? The wife of Abu Bakr radiallahu an says, Abu Bakr walked into the home on that day and he was feeling the wall. And I said to him, Abu Bakr, what are you doing? He says, I remember a needle that I left in the wall somewhere. I'm looking for that. When I made an intention to give everything, I meant everything, including the needle. <laughs> what motivated them? They understood that when we give, we are benefiting ourselves, not Allah. When we, that is why he said that when Allah blesses you, don't raise your wall and your fence, raise your table. When Allah gives you, Give more and then see the barakah. In Saudi, a friend of mine who worked at the charity office, he says one day a lady walked in, she came to the counter and she put a little box on the counter. She looked at him, she put the box on the counter and she literally darted out, she ran out. So he thought, okay, something happened, the lady will come back, he opens the box and it's laden with gold jewelry. So he closes it, he calls his supervisor, they take this and they put it into a safe. Thinking this lady, we don't know what her objective was, but she probably something came up and she ran, she'll come back. They keep it in the safe. After a year, this lady comes back to the same office. She walks in and she scans the faces of all these people working in this office. And then she walks straight up to this man. She comes up to this man and she tells him that a lady walked in here and put a box of jewelry. This brother says, my feet became like jelly. Because he says, normally we wait for a year, just prior to that one month earlier, we realized nobody's coming back, so we took that jewelry, we cashed it, and we gave it out in charity. Okay. He says, now I thought to myself, if this lady is back to collect her, her gold and the jewelry, what am I going to do? She looks at him and she said, what did you do? He said, a month ago, we cashed all this jewelry and we gave it out in charity. She looks at him and she says, do you understand how you delayed me? So he says, what do you mean? He says, I was diagnosed with a severe illness. There was no hope for me. I went for a talk and I heard the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Dawu mardakum is sadaqa. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, treat your ill through charity. She says, when I heard this hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I made an intention that our life, these are the words of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that treat your ill through charity, 
I have got full conviction. Oh Allah, I'm going to take all my jewelry and I'm giving it out in charity. She says, one month ago, I went for my test and I'm completely clear. She says, were you to distribute it earlier, Allah would have given me my shifra earlier. He looked at her and he said, sister, why did you leave it on the table and run out? What does she say? She says, when I heard the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I made the intention, all thoughts came in my mind that, you know, maybe give a portion. When I put it on this table, I did not want to give shaitan the ability and the opportunity to make me change my mind and say, okay, let me give a portion. I left it and I ran so shaitan doesn't have the chance to make me change my mind. Mm. Allah has given us all the opportunity. Allah has given us all the ability to be hope for humanity. This is what Allah has given each and every one of us. What do we need to do? We need to take that step forward. Become the means of hope throughout the world. Allah has given us all the opportunity in your own country, in your own town. You see a homeless person, go and help them. You see an elderly person, go and help them. You've got your Alim Dar office. You've got the in Alim Dar doing work throughout the world. Go forward, put yourself forward, and then see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you throughout the world. Understand one thing. In the beginning, I said a hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that inna lillahi khalqan khalaqahum li hawa'ijin nas. Verily, Allah has created a handful of people who will be there to fulfill the needs of people. People come to them for the fulfillment of their needs. But how does that hadith end? The Prophet said, فَإِذَا مَلُّوا When they get tired and they complain and they say, Why me? And how much can I do? Does Allah stop the good work? No. Does Allah put the charity on her pause? No. Does Allah put hope on pause? No. What does Allah do? Naqalaha ila ghayrihim. All that Allah does is Allah takes away the bounty from here and Allah gives it to somebody else. And that same hope carries on from there. Allah has given you and I the ability. Allah has given us the opportunity to become the hope of people throughout the world. Never, ever, ever underestimate the little that you do. Never underestimate, no matter what Allah has given you, never ever underestimate the power of Allah. Understand that Allah looks at your heart that you give it worth. Allah does not look at the amount that you give. Allah looks at how, what heart you give it worth. There are volunteers of this organization that I've seen that, Wallah, Wallah. I look and I think to myself, Oh Allah, how have you blessed these people? Their days and their nights are spent in what? Serving the Ummah who they haven't even seen or know. Imagine on the day of Qiyamah, when we come in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who are we coming in front of? The man who on his deathbed was experiencing the pangs of death. Aisha Rilana said, when you see someone experiencing Sakarat, don't ever look down upon them. Because I saw Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam undergoing Sakarat and undergoing the pangs of death. She said, don't ever think it's something wrong. At that moment when Nabi Sallallahu was undergoing the pangs of death, what did he do? That Nabi of Allah, who told the angel of death, go and ask Allah, will every ummati of mine experience the same pain in the time of death? And the angel goes to Allah, and he comes back and he says, oh Nabi of Allah, Allah says, every ummati, every human will feel this. What did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Go back to Allah and tell Allah to remove the pangs of death from my entire ummah and give it to me now so that my ummah don't have to suffer. That Nabi of Allah, when you and I come in front of him on the day of Qiyamah, what have we done for his ummah? Those who have given their lives for the service of humanity will come in front and say, Oh Nabi of Allah, because these people were your ummah, we don't know them, we probably never saw them, but Oh Allah, O Nabi of Allah, we gave our effort. We gave our, whatever you gave us, we gave it to help your ummah. Who will be honored on that day? Don't ever look at what you are giving. Look at what heart you're giving it with. The easiest thing is to give a donation. The easiest thing is to give a donation. The hardest thing is to get the donation into the right hand. And that is what the responsibility of this organization is taken. When you give... Give for the pleasure of Allah, and I'll finish. On one occasion, there was a masjid being built in the time of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah. And the man who was putting up this masjid was very wealthy, and he made a condition. He said, nobody will donate even one dirham to this masjid. 
I'm doing it solely and exclusively. So he gave everything for the masjid and the masjid was being built. And there was a plaque outside this masjid site that put his name and said, this is the man building the masjid. When the masjid neared completion, this man sees a dream that he's looking at the plaque in this board outside the masjid and his name is sketched out and there's a name of a woman. He gets up afraid and he tells his servants, go and look on the board if my name is still there. So they rush and they go and they see his name is there. They come back and they say, what are you on about? Your name is still there. He says, okay, it's fine. The next day he sees the same dream. He gets up and he tells his servants again, go and see if my name is taken off. Allah. They go and they come back and they say, your name is still on the board. The third day he sees the same dream. So he himself goes to this masjid site. He comes in, he looks and he sees his name is still on. But the third day he remembers the name of the woman who he saw in his dream. He summons this lady. Who is it? It is an old lady. He, when he calls this woman, the old lady is already shaking and shivering. Then what does this man want from me? What did I do? So they call this old lady and they ask her, what did you give for this masjid? She says, nothing. I know the condition was nobody could donate anything. So they call Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah. And he looks at this old lady and he says, think very carefully. Have you done anything for this masjid? She says, oh, Umar, I've done nothing for this masjid. One day I was going past and the horses that were carrying the bricks for this masjid looked very tired. So I said, oh Allah, I can't even give a brick for your house, but I will give water to the horse that is carrying the brick for your house. Allah. She says, I would give water every day to the horses that carry the bricks for this house. Umar bin Abdul Aziz Rahimullah looks at this man and he said, see whose action Allah has accepted. Allah has given all of us the ability, each and every one of us, what is our responsibility? To make sure we are part of the whole team. Make sure we are part of hope for humanity. Because that is the honor of this ummah. When Allah created the earth, when Allah created this entire universe, the earth started shaking. The earth started shaking. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the earth, Istaqir, be calm. And Allah put mountains onto the entire earth. So the mountains will jibala awtada. Allah says in the Quran, we created the mountains as stabilizers. So the entire earth calmed down. The angels who were witnessing this scenario were perplexed. And they said, Oh Allah. They said, Ya Rabbana, Hal fi khalqika shay'un ashaddu min al jibal? Oh Allah, is there anything in your creation more strong? Stronger than mountains? And Allah said, Naam. Yes. Al Hadid. You're looking at the awe of mountains. I've created something stronger than mountains. It is steel, iron. And Allah said to the angels, The steel and this iron will cut through mountains. They said, Ya Rabbana, Hal fi khalqika shay'un ashaddu min al Hadid. Allah, have you created anything stronger than iron? Allah said, Naam. Al Nar. I've created fire because fire will melt even the iron and steel. They said, Ya Rabbana, Hal fi khalqika shay'un ashaddu min al nar Allah, have you created something even stronger than fire? And Allah said, Naam. I've created something stronger than fire. Ma, water. Water will extinguish fire. They said, Ya Rabbana, Hal fi khalqika shay'un ashaddu min al ma Something stronger in your creation than water? Allah said, Naam. Al-Rih, the wind. The wind carries water. It is stronger than water. The angel said, Ya Rabbana, Hal fi khalqika shay'un ashaddu min al-Rih. Allah, have you created anything in your vast creation that is even stronger than wind? And Allah said, Naam. Abdun, Abdun, idha anfaqa bi sadaqatin bi yameenihi. Yes, I have created something that is stronger than the mountain, stronger than the iron, stronger than the fire, stronger than the water, stronger than the wind. I have created something stronger and more effective than that. And what is it? Allah said, when my servant gives charity with his right hand and his left hand is completely oblivious of it. What is the power of our charity? This is what Allah has given us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the hope for humanity. Amen. Despite the crisis throughout the world, 
May Allah accept each and every one of us. May Allah accept your town. May Allah accept your masjid. May Allah accept your ulama. May Allah accept your elders. May Allah accept this entire country and the entire ummah to become the hope that we ought to be for this ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept everything that you've done. And may Allah continue making you that supporting hand to the Alimdad Foundation that go out and carry on doing this good work. And may Allah make you part of the team. This is not a close corporation. This is a team that wants your hands. This is a team that wants your du'as. This is a team that wants your support. Become the hope for humanity despite the crisis so that on the day of Qiyamah, at least we can put one thing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you abundantly. Allah, it's been a pleasure being with people that are such, such hospitable people. And wallah, all of these faces full of noor. May Allah gather us once again in Jannah. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah.